bird as a kufr and uh, as you're walking in the street uh, as you walk, I, walk, walk in the street uh, actually um, my wife suffered it my children suffered it uh, in and this Car is in Bradford this is in Bradford in, in Islam in black and white it is agreed upon these five Islamic schools of thought the ulema that apostasy is worthy of death they, they broke into the house the vacant house next door uh, and actually they, they deliberately set the house on fire in the hopes that it would spread to my home the, the, this sergeant his, his words to me were uh, you know um, uh, you, you don't belong there you my know, gosh. Uh, and um, he said that. Yeah, he, he told me to stop being a crusader and move out the area. And, oh uh, my gosh. Welcome. Um, just uh, to let you know, we talked at the very beginning of the year that we were going to try and broaden out what so Cool Films was doing with regards to um, our content. We wanted to diversify the content and to expand the channel to include other things connected to the interaction between Christianity and Islam, between the church and the secular world and so on. Um, and you might have heard me mention in the past the story of a Christian convert from a Muslim background called Nisar, um, who uh, suffered terribly for the choice to follow Christ um, and here is Nissa. Um, Nissa, welcome to Soko Films thank you so much for for having us okay. it's good to meet you um, we've we've already sent Nissa the questions so he knows what questions uh, we're going to to be reading and I'm literally going to read them off the screen um, and we're gonna just tell Nissa's story and you guys can hear it as it unfolds so to start off, Nisar, um, tell us a little bit about what it was like to grow up as a Muslim. Uh, looking back, actually, um, you know, we were, yeah, we were from a Pakistani um, Islam, actually, um, a Miripuri background. But if I can just try to put into context what you envisage or people understand in this day and age, mm. over the last few decades, especially this last decade, uh, I'm a, a a son of a, a immigrant parents actually born uh, and raised um, in Birmingham. Yeah, and of course, uh, life looking back now uh, was very different. And in light of what we've gone through, and I'm sure you'll you'll talk me through that, and, uh, mm. and I will walk you through our journey. Yeah. Uh, and I often have these conversations with, uh, with my children. But, you know, um, we grew up, uh, we sort of were, were British, we took on Britishness. But uh, as to conform to the, the Islamic uh, way of life, it was incumbent upon us to go to uh, a mosque. Yeah. We, we weren't going to a mega mosque at the time. Mm. Uh, I have a, a vivid memory of uh, going to a mosque uh, for a few hours every day, which uh, I, I even at that time I didn't like, and uh, for various reasons. But mm. in a nutshell, it was a house that was, had been converted or yeah. uh, you know uh, made into a madrasa uh, mm. actually. So every day, growing up uh, as a youngster, uh, we would go along, my brother and I, and um, be taught this. Arabic, this ancient sort of Arabic, the, the Quran, mm. which didn't um, make a jot of uh, difference to us or understanding. Yeah. Uh, and so it was just a, a, a rigmarole of mm. going through the motions and just sort of come in, uh, Eid celebrations, Eid time or Ramadan, you know, the, the household would sort of obviously conform to uh, fasting or whatever. Uh, that's basically what I remember but on the, uh, on the whole uh, you know we just went about our, our daily lives in between sort of mm. uh, mingling with with English friends sort of uh, West Indian friends Irish friends you know so the, we, we were a, a mixed bag mm. and, I, and what sort of united us was our sense of Britishness if you like our, our ID 
uh, grow, uh, as British people growing up yeah. uh, in, in the community. Okay, and and so, so just some quick follow-on questions to that. What what branch of, are you conscious of? What branch of Islam your family was bringing? Yes, uh, Sunni, uh, Sunni Islam. It's the any mainstream. particular legal school? Uh, no, actually, my, my 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 father was very. Uh, liberal, tolerant, uh, as okay. all my uncles were, uh, the wider family. Yeah. Um, often on the weekend, uh, Friday evenings, sort of weekends, my father would be out uh, actually at the local pub, uh, whether uh, he'd uh, meet up with uh, uncles or other men folk, yeah. uh, you know, from the extended family. Or, or so you come from, a, 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 it sounds like a, a pretty well integrated. Uh, at, yeah, you, uh, like generation. Mm. Uh, certainly, at that time, uh, yeah. actually, uh, it, it was common knowledge. You know, uh, dad would be down the, the local pub in my household. You yeah, know, and uh, whether a few uncles or relatives came along, and they'd they'd all be sort of down the local pub. But on the whole, I, I don't think my dad liked anything better than to meet up with his friends. Uh, not necessarily sort of worked friends. Uh, yeah. he worked for. Uh, British Leyland at the time, mm. uh, you know, actually, and so, uh, but, you know, whenever I had to go and grab him, if somebody, for example, did come along or he was needed, uh, often my mum would sort of say, you know, go and get your dad, and I just would run down to the local pub and go in, actually, and discreetly yeah. sort of call him out, and uh, yeah. actually, and that, that these are my memories, actually, you know. Fair uh, enough. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, it's uh, a, 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 a life that I think many English people can... Mm. Can equate to. Mm. Um, so tell us a little about your your life as a Muslim. I get the feeling that, for the most part, when you were growing up, it, it felt more cultural than a uh, personal. Thing. Yeah, actually, I meant to use that word. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was more cultural. Okay, uh, so tell us a little bit was... about what it was like uh, as you were more matured. You know, uh, did it remain cultural or did it become a personal faith for yourself? Oh, actually, you sort of fifteen, sixteen. You know, for some reason, you don't have to sort of. You're not. You're not then sort of bombarded or pushed to go to mosque, and then you really come away and just do your own thing, really. And nobody yeah. asks, you know, why aren't you going to mosque to learn scriptures? It's sort of down to yourself. Um, yeah. I had one, two friends. You know, they might be deemed to be religious and sort of kept on sort of going regularly uh, and taking it further. But mm -hmm. on the whole, most of us. Uh, and when I say most of us, uh, the local Pakistani Muslims like myself, yeah. uh, a handful of you know similar scenario. They're more uh, out sort of um, playing around and you know um, and actually just doing their thing really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And were you in that kind of second category, that kind of category? Yeah, we like nothing. Just getting on with your own life as a normal kid of yeah. your that age and generation would have. Yeah, certainly. Like nothing better, but than to you know meet up. Uh, as I say, not necessarily sort of fellow Pakistanis, but uh, various mates and uh, various uh, you know color and creeds and sort of uh, yeah, ethnic background and such like. But again, we all gelled and we all. I think saw ourselves, you know, uh, as British. That was the common sort of denominator, and uh, yeah. actually there was never discussions of, oh, I'm a Muslim and or he's a Catholic and yeah, uh, you know, he's a Christian. People uh, just got on. With we we just got on with it actually, and we 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 we, we uh, you know we played and uh, recreational stuff and uh, actually cricket. Yeah, cr cricket, football, yeah. Uh, Squash. Are you more a cricket man or a football? Uh, man? I I'm a, more of a squash man to be honest with you. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was absolutely uh, uh, dotty about uh, squash. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. And and how did you meet your um, your beloved wife? Was uh, it in the mosque or it, was this after your conversion? Uh, it was a, um, a typical arranged marriage. Okay. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that because to a lot of our audience, the idea. I mean, to me, I understand what an arranged marriage is, and I have no problem with them at all. Um, but tell us a little about uh, how that worked, because that will be alien to a lot of people. It was alien to me, to be quite frank with you. Yeah. To totally alien. Uh, I, it really hit me like a ton of bricks. But uh, actually, my father, uh, it was sort of uh, early um, 88, mm -hmm. uh, possibly back end of 87, he'd gone out uh, to um, uh, Kashmir, uh, uh, Mirapur. Yeah. Uh, my grandmother had died a year or two prior, and actually my father was in his late sort of 90s, and. Uh, and my father just felt to sort of semi-retire, look, look after him, take care of him actually. And um, and I just remember my mother not particularly telling me exactly, but 
but really almost pushing me on the plane, saying, well, dad, your dad wants you over there. And I had an inkling. What was uh, going to happen? Uh, what was going to happen. Yeah. And it did go against the grain, to be fair, mm. uh, actually. But uh, as a subservient son, you know, I just uh, felt to do the best I could do. Uh, bearing in mind, actually, my, my younger brother, uh, uh, Iftikhar, um, he was in a relationship with a, uh, a lass, actually, and um, father was from a Sikh background, mother was Irish, actually, mm -hmm. and so he'd kind of absconded, and uh, I, I just, there was this sense of, well, he's kind of let the family down because everything revolves around the family, you know, yeah. and, uh, yeah. um, and, and this sort of code of family and, you know, family ethics and what more. Family honour. Family, you know, yeah, and so, uh, and I just felt, you know what, uh, Regardless of my sort of Britishness, uh, actually, I should just uh, do the, you know, honourable thing, what was expected of me, yeah. uh, as, uh, you know, uh, as an older son, actually. And uh, so I went along uh, in April of 88, mm -hmm. and no sooner did I land, actually, in um, sort of five, six hours journey from Islamabad airport, uh, sort of north through Pakistan, uh, ended up... Um, in Mirapur and in the village and uh, you know they um, celebration started and uh, actually it went on for every day for the uh, best part of a week actually and then mm. the following week all I know is that uh, I traveled to where my wife lived and uh, we were married oh wow yeah, yeah but it, it was a, a huge blow actually it, it really uh, I was numb. Yeah, the whole experience was alien, uh, yeah. actually, and um, uh, and so. However, but uh, here you are, so many years later, with children. Uh, and... yes, so we have uh, we have um, six amazing children. I, I thank God for them. The being, Thanks, uh, and I will talk you through that as well, actually. But yeah, uh, they've just been so remarkable, mm. and um, but uh, ultimately, you know. Um, I mean, I, I just, I, I mean, that 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 in itself is a fascinating story, um, and it just goes to show actually that there are other models of creating family that the church should be considering, rather than the romantic model that we get from Hollywood. But I don't want to get sidetracked. No, no, I don't want to get sidetracked onto uh, that. And of, and of course, very quickly, we can align it biblically as well. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. It's a much more yeah. uh, Abraham, biblical, Isaac, absolutely, so that kind of. It's a far yeah. more biblical way of constructing families than than what we're doing in the West. Yeah, well. but I do see, I, I do see God's hand. Yeah. Uh, on, on, on this marriage and my wife mm. uh, because again um, you know she's come to faith and um, and so we are a complete family amen uh, as a Christian family actually yeah. And, right. uh, yeah, but, well, uh, yeah. coming to coming to that very thing in your life and however long it was before you became a, you know, just before you started seriously thinking about Christianity what were your perceptions of Christianity as a Muslim my perceptions, uh, actually, as a Muslim, you, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a funny one, really, but because you, 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 you really didn't pay sort of that much attention, actually. I mean, mm. you, you, you felt it was. Uh, I, I mean, I, I've got to confess, thinking back, even at the age of like sort of five or six, reading these Ladybird books, yeah, I was riveted to this figure of Jesus mm. in this lovely picturesque book uh, this uh, amazing man uh, who could make the blind see the lame to walk and so from an early age I was riveted to this figure of Christ mm. uh, actually and although I didn't have much dealings with church because I didn't go to a, a CV church or a Catholic church uh, yeah. a, a Catholic primary school for example and such like yeah but we had the Odd experience going to um, is it the um, the Harvest Festival mm. services? Yeah, yeah, and, the and ones in church. Yeah, in, yeah, so, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, and uh, I, I was naturally in awe uh, of the of the kind of setting and such like. So it was when it, that 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 string that well, I mean, it was even weak back then, but it was certainly stronger than it is now. That that sort of strong presentation of Christianity. Yes, certainly, and of course, left uh, its mark. Uh, and Christmas time, yeah, uh, Easter, uh, Easter, and Christmas time, yeah. Uh, actually, there was just this remarkable 
sense of not only just festivity but the theme of uh, of our Lord actually mm. uh, which resonated me with with me from that early age actually so a strong a stronger Christian culture was leaving an Im impression uh, uh, upon you s certainly I would say that would be the case yeah that's something that the that, 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 that church should probably be thinking about um, yeah. what was it then that that put Christianity first on your radar in a serious sense not like as a backdrop or as an echo that you were hearing in the surrounding culture but what was it that kind of put Christianity as like in front of you even if it was perhaps at a distance it, it was a life change of a school uh, rebel, uh, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, bless him, uh, John, who uh, I saw coming in at one time, and he had a history of absconding, quite a um, you know um, hard as nails character, uh, rough around the edges, actually. Well, quite rough himself, you know. Uh, you know, sort of tattooed and yeah. ear piercings and sort of Mohican haircut and just a total, bit of a rocker. total yeah total rebel yeah uh, and and a, and a sort of real uh, you know um, a hard case and uh, uh, and often he would he would abscond and working the uh, the markets the, uh, the rag sort of markets of Bullring city centre in Birmingham and then uh, being collared by the authorities, brought back. So it, this would go on for some for a few years, as certainly as we were in secondary school. Mm. On one occasion, he, he came, and I, I literally uh, almost fell off my chair because he was just transformed. Uh, it was civilized. The Mohican had gone. The ear piercings had gone. The tattoos were, were uh, sort of were, were covered, civilized code, mm. and and reading the, the 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 New Testament. Well, he had actual complete Bible in his carrier bag. Wow! And he he had it in, in the classroom wrapped up, and every given opportunity, he would delve into it, and uh, he was extremely approachable, and that whole transformation it literally not just myself but a handful of other Pakistani lads muslim lads mm. uh, because we weren't identified by our this faith at the faith at the time but yeah. as we, as we hear about it often in this day and age mm. and uh, i was just again just so attracted and drawn to to john and we would talk for hours on end and uh, initially he said to me you know i'm a born again christian and i said well what's a born again christian mm. And we would talk, and he would sort of uh, compound stuff and explain stuff and whatever. And then, after a few weeks, he imparted to me a Gideon New Testament. Yes, yeah. Now, I do remember sort of looking back at it. It, it, it was, we were taught that this is taboo, this is the lie of the devil, it's been altered, it's been doctored. Is this what you've been taught in the, the past? This, this is what we were, uh, not necessarily taught it per se, but something which was picked up on common currency, common the, common currency, yeah, within the Islamic. Uh, th th that's right, yeah, yeah. and sort of in, in the sort of natural jurisprudence of things, you know. Yeah, uh, and so, uh, and it, and I remember this taboo thing. I, I kind of thought, how do I now take this with me in my home? So I, anyway, I, I put it in the inside of my blazer, and I went uh, away, went home. That's interesting that you felt almost ashamed embarrassed or or nervous about it, it literally was taboo it was something that was ingrained yeah uh, in me to, to, to say that we mustn't touch this thing yeah yeah you know it's sort of unholy improper if you like for use that expression and uh, however i was just so curious and just uh, 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 and then wanted to sort of see mm. what john had and anyway, I took it with me. Actually, kind of broke every rule in sort of the household. But, but unbeknown to them, I kind of put in my mattress, and I would read it every, every evening. So even your cultural Muslim father, yeah, God rest his soul, I'm guessing. Yes, yeah, he who who used to go down to the bar and was integrated into society, even in his house, it was a taboo thing to have a New Testament. Precisely. I mean, my, my father wasn't a model of a, a, a of a Muslim. He yeah. was, was just sort of maybe under the umbrella and conforming to that pattern, you know, on, what the, I, on the outside. What I find interesting about that is is the, the heaviness of the, the prejudice mm. laying within the community that even at a cultural level, mm. it, it's still present, you know, that 
you know, th mm. th this is a, a particularly well integrated family, a liberal, open minded, um, you know, and yet. As most that, families were. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But that attitude is still there. Y yeah, it's. Um... Because there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people, particularly liberal progressives and liberal do gooders, who, who think that. The Islamic community has no prejudice against Christians at all. Uh, uh, no, on the contrary, they have every prejudice. Uh, and, uh, I don't want to jump too deep okay. into that because I know that's yeah. going to come later. Uh, but but, but in, if I can just wrap it up for you, Bobby, he, yeah. he, he actually, he, he, as a lot of, and even to this day, uh, it's nominality, it's nominal. Yeah. The same can be said for the Catholic and Christians. It's a, a, an overall a nominal thing, uh, unless you sort of obviously become more committed and such like yeah but certainly my father my uncles all the men folk they were nominal mm. i i never saw them going to mosque to pray during the week uh, not even it, not even on a friday at that yeah. time you know growing up growing up uh, actually but however yes but still when it comes down to the islamic conforms it's a no-no but i and i as i say i used to read it with a uh, you know with a vengeance of an evening, mm. and I read the Gospels. And the just, letters. just to help with the chronology, was this before or after you got married? This, this was before. But this was before. So this is what kind of put it first onto your radar. So give That's us right. an overview. Um, give us an overview and and a sort of an overview of how you went from being a Muslim mm -hmm. to being a Christian. Like, how would you sort of explain that process okay i would say very quickly that for further to read the, the the gospel message the new testament actually that i felt that in my heart of hearts i'd become a christian i'd accepted the lord uh, you know i i confessed uh, because even i recognized as a 15 year old mm. despite going to mosque whatever i didn't live up to the mark and i i, I could see through the gospel message that i needed salvation and so I confessed Christ and I very quickly, I did meet with John's pastor and the second most amazing thing that happened to me further to that was that this man was a ex, um, well, he was, he was from a Sikh background, yeah. but he was no longer Sikh. Mm. So John's pastor was a, was a Sikh. So he was a, the first convert I'd ever come across. Yeah. And that blew me away as well, actually. Mm. And he would spend hours, we would talk, we would engage, he would uh, expound the Bible, the New Testament, uh, and um, actually, so I, I, I would say I, I became a committed Christian, but because of um, the uh, the fear uh, of my parents or family finding out, I didn't particularly confess mm. openly. It, it seemed at that time I was the only convert from a Pakistani Mirapuri Muslim background in the whole world actually so yeah. you can deem me as a secret believer if you like yeah but um, very quickly uh, my mother put paid that because she discovered the New Testament in my um, while well, one evening as mothers do come along yeah uh, just clean up your room. yeah and so we'll just see how um, uh, her son is doing actually and I'd fallen asleep it was sort of obviously late evening and uh, uh, I sort of she'd found the, the New Testament sort of resting in my chest and actually uh, all I remember the following morning waiting when I woke up my mother sort of screaming and tearing the place down and then threatening to go to my father and my father you know we're from a, uh, the big men you know yeah. I'm one of the smaller guys actually yeah. and uh, so six foot four big man ruling with a rod of iron and that really instilled the fear of God in me and uh, all I can say to you is thereafter I stopped going to these fellowship uh, meetings. meetings stop meeting with John stop meeting with other sort of Christian sort of uh, friends I'd made mm. uh, actually and, uh, and and I didn't really rededicate my life until uh, 1996 okay so I mean that 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 indicates something again of, of something that we're talking about on Soko films and we're, we're trying to highlight but that people want to deny is the fact that there is this really embittered and trenchant um, animosity towards the Christian faith, and and this uh, this sense of shame that 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 someone should own a New Testament and be a Muslim or re be reading the New Testament is that is that fair to characterize it like that? Uh, see it like that, or 
is it not shame but anger? What what do you think it's rooted in that? It, 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 uh, again, going by my own personal experience, it's rooted in the fact that uh, uh, it is a common held belief in Islam, and it's sort of poured out and shouted out that uh, the 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 Bible is a lie, mm. actually, and it's been doctored and altered. Yeah. And one mustn't mustn't touch it actually. Mm. So that was my personal, uh, uh, and it's, to this day, it, it still goes on, and probably more, much more so now than it did growing up uh, in the sort of early seventies. Do you think that really explains the reaction? Like, if it was just a case of this is not a trustworthy book, then, but the the sense of sort of outrage that you're describing seems to be deeper than than just this is not a trustworthy book but coming from somewhere else it's just a, a, a commonly held uh, opinion belief uh, which is then obviously it's a taboo yeah uh, as I, I guess uh, it's that it's why is it a taboo though you know what uh, I, I, I think it, it, for me as a convert it, it, it's fear of uh, actually uh, recognizing the truth for what it is really mm -hmm. you know and, and so uh, and again, we can talk about uh, the uh, we've 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 suffered as a family terrorism. Yeah, we will we'll come. To that. Uh, and so it's it's just simply ingrained in Islam that it seems it deems himself as a uh, a uh, superiority uh, type religion mm. that uh, you know they are Allah's best and they are. So to be anything less than a Muslim is to become something worse. It's, it's to become something worse. So, and, and also it, it, what you, your story highlights that even back, way back when, so this was what, 70s, 80s? Uh, we're talking uh, early 80s. So it, even, even then the church wasn't in a position to support uh, people that were showing interest in the Christian faith because... You obviously evidently did have interest, but your family was able to, to shut that down. Uh, as I say, uh, there there was uh, that there was no thinking of oh well I'll go to John yeah uh, or I'll go to Pastor uh, Joseph Batoy, uh, the deceit pastor as I mentioned earlier. Mm. Uh, actually, he will then obviously bring me in. He will safeguard me, shield me. There, there, there was you couldn't see past the family. Yeah, and actually, as I say, you just didn't know. Uh, also, well, you're never ingrained in the Sharia. I didn't know what Sharia was till my sort of what uh, late twenties. Yeah, you, it's a blind leap of faith. You go along, and as I say, you you learn and taught the the, the Quranic scriptures, which don't mean anything, you know. And uh, there's no such thing as a translation in the mosques or whatever. So you're reading this Arabic? It, it, it's Arabic. It's ancient Arabic that you you don't... Uh, you don't actually know what you're reading? Not one jot of it. You just recite it? You, you just recite it, you learn it actually, you go through the rigmarole of uh, prayer or Ramadan, uh, actually fasting, uh, Eid celebration uh, and all the rest of it. Yeah. So like, uh, but again, it's a lot of it's cultural. As opposed to, uh, yes, there is a religious aspect to it, but there's also a very deep cultural. Um, they, they, they lend itself hand in hand. Uh, it's so intertwined, you can't separate one from the other. Mm -hmm. um, I've had Pakistanis stop saying Aslam when it comes, the usual sort of uh, Arabic greeting, because as far as they're concerned, you, you know, you are. You're it's not, interesting they greet yeah. you in Arabic rather than either in English or even but, but as the a language but, of your homeland. But as somebody who's come out of the, the as, homeland. Yeah, as somebody who's come out of, uh, of Islam, yeah. that all stops. Yeah. Uh, and it's good morning or hello, uh, you know, actually. So uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a case, a clear case of uh, you're, you're in or you're out. There is no middle ground. There is mm. no tolerance. There is no acceptance. Yeah, uh, because uh, again, we can talk about this. Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're coming. Yeah. We're, we're coming to that. So you talked about rededicating um, your life a bit later on. Mm. So, so just give us a summary of of, of how you um, ended up rededicating your life. Uh, well, just, uh, yeah. If I could just quickly finish off uh, and then bring you on to that point. That uh, yeah. So after I stopped fellowship, it uh, I, I think we use this word backslide, which I didn't know what it was yeah. until uh, later on. When I re so dedicated my life, actually, but so uh, yeah, we fall back into the world, actually, and, and so uh, here we are now uh, in uh, uh, 
1988, so uh, got married, uh, settled down, um, uh, a few children came along and then uh, very, very sadly, uh, I lost a brother, um, Iftikhar, who was a year younger than me. Mm. Uh, he died very suddenly, actually, and um, uh, my father uh, was backwards and forwards uh, to Pakistan all these years, and then actually I had to break the news to him. And so what happened in a nutshell, I escorted or um, uh, took um, Iftikhar's body uh, to, because my father requested okay. yeah. uh, that uh, I bring it uh, bring his casket uh, to uh, Mirapur, yes, for burial because uh, they have a family yeah. burial, just yeah, yeah, like you know. Yeah. Uh, I have, uh, that's a deep regret, but that's but that's anyway actually. But uh, but the thing is that I then uh, went at that time. Um, uh, he, as I say, he, he passed away in '96, and while I was there, you appreciate uh, it was uh, uh, it's pain like I never knew before, mm. uh, and actually. Uh, on the day that uh, we we when we landed and eventually some hours later got to our destination and then they were ready and willing to prepare to uh, bury him there and then and I made a confession of faith I was just going to rededicate my life to the Lord. You did that in Mirapur. In Mirapur, yeah. Uh, how did what, did you do that just personally? No, per 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 or did just you personally. I, I, personally, I asked the Lord. Um, I, I, as far as I, I know, there is Christians as I know it now, but yeah. it, even while I was there. I wouldn't have known any Christian whatsoever, especially to, uh, as you know, it's classed as an Islamic country, and then in the villages and such like, in Mirapur, it's staunch uh, Muslims, and I believe there there are uh, uh, tiny fragments of Christian communities dotted around, but it's something which I wouldn't have had that connection, you know? Yeah. So I, I to myself, and I said, well, Lord, you know, it's just a matter of time before uh, I'm six foot under, and I've been running from you all this time and I just want to rededicate my life. So that early experience that you'd had in your teenage years had never actually left you? It, it never left me, no. I always... Uh, it was always there? It was always there. I always realised that the, the, the Lord Jesus was uh, Son of God and, mm. uh, and uh, there's only one way uh, uh, to God the Father and that was through the Lord and salvation Amen. was through Christ. And, Amen. So despite my own kind of wretched state, if you like, and sort of falling away to the world, I always held on to that faith. How did family and friends react to this? Well, you appreciate I, I didn't mention uh, to anybody in Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, actually, and when I came back after three weeks after burying my brother, hmm. uh, who was 29 at the time, that uh, we'd been living in Bradford uh, since 1990. And we're now talking 96. Uh, and I had two young children, four and two respectively. And so uh, even to my wife, I didn't uh, mention to her. Uh, I just sort of kept it to myself. Mm. And I remember at work, uh, actually, uh, there was a young man who used to always be, we uh, try to engage and talk. And, and he was a, a committed Christian. And it tried to invite me over a period of time to come to his uh, his local uh, fellowship and I'd sort of duck and dive but uh, as I say I, 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 I was very broken actually and uh, the pain is indescribable uh, the loss of, uh, of losing my brother actually and uh, I was very empty and, and needed fellowship and I uh, said to Richard look uh, Richard uh, you know, I, I've been a Christian for many years, mm. since the age of 15, uh, but uh, it's, it's a long story, but however, I'd like to, to join your fellowship, and he was absolutely elated, and uh, I can't describe to you his, his excitement, and uh, mm. literally running around the room, actually, but in there, I started going to um, that fellowship with, with Richard, uh, my work colleague, and uh, being a younger man, actually, I used to sort of... Uh, seem quite uh, regular thereafter, but it was a few weeks later, uh, and, and for the life of me, and I don't, to this day I don't know, that my wife actually confronted me and said, you're going to church. And that really um, kind of, uh, as I say, blew me away. I, I just couldn't understand how she, she because she grew up uh, in, in a village, and there were no churches mm. uh, roundabout. 
uh, she wouldn't have any, any idea of what Christianity was or who mm. Christians were and such like. Even Pakistani Christians, which I came to know <coughs> sort of a year or two uh, after I kind of rededicated my uh, my life and, and I'm now 30. Mm. And so I said to her, yes, I am. And my wife's immediate reaction was to literally uh, yank one of the kids out of my lap and pull my boy uh, to her side and say, I don't want anything to do with you. Don't come near me. Wow. And you appreciate that was, uh, you know, really tough. And, um, I was absolutely numb. And I remember just sat there and sat there and sitting there <laughs> and saying, Lord, well, you know, well, you know how it is. I. Uh, well, I'm trying to get over the pain of losing my brother, and you saw it fit to take his life, and uh, but uh, to lose my wife and my children, I I, I don't know what to do, you know, uh, and, and how to go from here. And it was thereafter, actually, that uh, literally we were living separate lives, uh, actually, for a few weeks, and then it's obviously showed on my persona and. Uh, one of the, the ladies at the fellowship uh, uh, approached me and said, Miss Hans, everything all right? And I said, well, well, no, not really. And when I explained to her, she said, well, is there any way that you, if we, I uh, would love to invite you. My, my husband used to be a missionary to China. Mm. And, you know, and we've, we've six children. And would you like to come to the home? It, do you feel that your wife would come along with you? And let, let's see, you know, uh, the Lord might just, uh, work through, you know, sort of make her realise that we're not all white devils and such like. And mm. so I said, okay. Uh, and I went uh, uh, about then trying to get my wife, who really and truly, if you can think about it, uh, from '88, so she, it was now eight years in the country, but she's still been so preoccupied with being a wife and then a mother. So I hadn't had much interaction. Uh, with English folk, apart mm. from one or two of my friends, you know, who I might, she might sort of see me mingle with from time to time. And then we we did take, uh, she took up the invite of of this uh, uh, lady and and she had a, a lovely time, uh, actually. And then she said, in the course of that conversation, she walked towards you and said, would you like to meet so-and-so, they're, they're Pakistani Christians, and, and to me that was music to my ears, because believe it or not, uh, I, 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 I was quite very ignorant, mm. and looking back, it's, things are suppressed, and I didn't know that there were Pakistan, such a thing as Pakistani Christians, because even, even to, at that point, would you yeah. believe, I thought I was the only one, mm. and so I took up her offer and, uh, of meeting them, and I really felt that that would go... A long way because obviously culturally my wife is from a Pakistani yeah. uh, sort of uh, heritage and, 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 and was born and raised in Pakistan mm -hmm. and that was a, a fruitful meeting and actually and then they said look you know we meet as a as a Christian fellowship Pakistani Christian fellowship mm -hmm. uh, once a month um, that we're few in number but we, we do gather and we have other people um, you know um, uh, non Pakistanis mixing with us as well and so we went and actually and uh, my wife was deep in thought and, uh, and I think uh, the spirit of the Lord has just been sort of touching her because uh, I remember then we were invited by the, the pastor to attend the Easter service and then I went away set about saying to my wife um, look the pastors in, in, and I explained what the pastor was and he invited you to uh, come along and then she took up that invitation and at the end of the, uh, when the altar call was given uh, and I looked around and I thought maybe my wife's gone to see the kids that were yeah. in, in the creche mm. and next thing I saw you know in this packed uh, um, room um, my wife uh, confessing Christ and just giving, uh, gi gi giving her heart to the Lord and I, I you know and actually so the Lord had really touched her actually and uh and she felt, she said to me after that she had really prayed and mm. was really at a crossroads, was really fearful, uncertain, a lot of emotions crossed her mind with family and all sorts of 
consequences. Mm. But she really felt that, that the Lord had led her to commit her, uh, her heart and faith uh, in Christ. Yeah. So that was a very emotional and wonderful day for, for us as a family. Mm. And what happened next? Once, because oh. um, I'm, I'm guessing obviously you, your family were baptized. What? So what happened? It, uh, but how was this sort of received within the wider community? How? What yeah. Happened uh, at that. Next? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. You're quite right. So you know, we started going to church uh, or fellowship, Christian fellowship, regular. Mm. And actually, uh, my very close Pakistani friend. You know who I saw as a as a family friend as well, actually, and, and I'm sure he felt felt the same way. I then said to him, "Well, look, just to let you know, I've embraced Christianity." And his immediate response was that I should never come to his door ever again. Wow. Uh, actually, and that. Um, and this is someone you considered almost like family. Uh, absolutely, you know, uh, uh, I, I loved and respected him, and he was a dear friend. Uh, and likewise, he, he welcomed me into the into the family setting. He was he was from a big extended family. Yeah. Uh, in his own words, he said, "I I have five brothers, and uh, he had uh, an older sisters as well." Mm. And he said, "Nisara, you were a sixth brother to me." Yeah. You know, but. He said, you know, we sat and ate from the same plate, and but you've forsaken the religion of my forefathers. And I said, well, with respect, uh, dear brother, uh, your forefathers, our forefathers, if you like, uh, they can't uh, give me salvation, mm. and I have this truth. Mm. And he said, you're not to come to my door again. So I walked away uh, from that. Um, Never saw him again, and uh, in actual fact, he's then uh, mentioned it. And they, they say in any Pakistani sort of community, close knit community, whether you're in Bradford, Birmingham, London, wherever you might be, and actually, the word seems to have gone out like wildfire. Mm. And then, as a result, you are shunned, uh, maligned, despised. My wife started um, uh, getting very negative comments and remarks at the school playground by some of the um, women, Pakistani Muslim women. Strangers? No, the, the, she, she, she knew them very, well, yeah. very well as a fellow school parent mm. uh, over the years. And uh, they uh, seemed to have this audacity uh, and uh, anger to turn around and say, well, uh, why are you not wearing a blouse or miniskirt and what uh, uh, and stuff like that actually and my wife was at, so in their minds becoming a christian meant wearing a miniskirt it, uh, that's right i've been sort of somehow uh loose or something actually mm. and my, my wife said well hold on you know you're born raised here i'm born raised in pakistan and i think they were referring to her her dress the the usual sort of um uh, shalwar and communities yeah. as they call yeah. it you know so uh, in essence um yeah so they uh, had contempt and uh would turn their back and there were issues there actually yeah, you know so but it didn't just stay at comments did it no because um, how did it uh, how it, did it, 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 it then uh, the, the local young men lawlessly with impunity are then sort of swearing and shouting and making all you know you're referred as a kufr kafir and uh as you're walking in the street, uh, as you, uh, uh, walk, walking the street, uh, actually, um, my wife suffered it, my children suffered it. Uh, in and this is in Bradford. This is in Bradford, in cars yeah. and uh, in the na in the neighbourhood, more to the point. Yeah. Uh, you know, these young men, seeing them grow up, are now uh, young men, and just um, taking upon themselves to uh, verbally abuse, evolves to physical confrontations, uh, where you're physically jostled, pushed around. Spat at, and then it then develops into criminal damage to your property. Where we've had cars torched, cars rammed, wow. uh, drive by brickings, and we, um, you know, nothing has pre prepares you for this actually. Yeah, uh, and so um, it was. Uh, uh, so, all know. of this escalated in, in, in roughly, just like in a way, roughly what time frame from. Uh, 
you the first person finding out you were Christian to you the first brick going through your car window. Oh, uh, what what type type of time scale are we talking about? Well, we're talking sort of uh, you know uh, a, a year or so. Within one year. Within one year, yeah. we went from I've become a Christian to you having your your property vandalized, being spat on in the street, being pushed around, being insulted, yeah. in one year. It, yeah, but basically uh, terrorized. In, in, in the midst of all of this, um, what support did you receive from the police? Uh, n no support. None? None. But hate crime? Did they, did uh, they, they? I mean, they, I don't know if hate crimes existed as a concept at this point. Uh, it might be. But no, they didn't. Uh, deem but it. still, it would have been criminal yeah. what you were going uh, through. But yeah, the, the police have, uh, um, uh, in, through our experience, uh, have turned a, a blind eye. Uh, despite the fact that a car's been uh, after it was um, torched, rammed, yeah, uh, with one of the neighbours, the the young men, who uh, were almost, these people known to you? Yeah, they were, were neighbours. So you could name them. I could name. I yeah, I could name yeah. them. I, I reported it at the time. And the police did nothing. They they did nothing. They went through the motions, but came back with with, with nothing actually. The police did nothing. They they done absolutely nothing, uh, actually. Yeah. And then, Any investigation? Uh, they, uh, or did they, they get, just kind they, of wash their hands? They kind of go through the rigmarole, but it, it comes to nothing, and you 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 just left sort of dangling, and, and you're in no man's land, and you're 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 in complete and utter fear of uh, life safety. Uh, we uh, it got so bad after some years of going through it actually that they, they even torched the house next door, which was vacant. Yeah, and uh, one of the ringleaders waited till I came from work then they know your comings and goings and said to me you know we've torched your car we're gonna burn you at your house why don't you leave so they were literally trying to drive you out of breath Th this this was their exact aim and they they, they, they they made no bones about it and i expressed the exact words to this um, sergeant chap do you know what's his name do you uh, remember the this, no i don't but uh, it's on record actually but i said to the, the sergeant look you know i've been threatened and um they're, they're gonna I've had my my house, uh, my, my car torch, now they're going to burn my home, burn me up my home, and they started giving me facts and figures, and um, no, this is very rarely happens. And uh, uh, anyway, um, so the police that will smash people's door down for twittering the wrong series of words are are recording all of this harassment in full knowledge of who the victims is, and they couldn't even put together an investigation where they they wait outside or in some other property to capture the evidence to uh, make an arrest nothing nothing at all nothing at all and we uh and what the, the this sergeant his, his words to me were uh you know um uh you, you don't belong there you my know? gosh uh, and um he said that yeah he, he told me to stop being a crusader and move out the area and oh that, my gosh and that was that was echoing um several officers in several incidents so the police was to blame the, the police attitude was to blame the victim to blame the victim and and also to somehow uh, suggest that I go and live in a um, a middle class area that I didn't belong here actually oh, so wow. yeah it's yeah it's absolutely appalling actually yeah. uh, it was literally uh, front line in the trenches stuff and, and the police and, weren't uh, but this then escalated into an attempt to take your life didn't it well yes uh, uh, i mean i i First and foremost, well, I, I, or am I, I skipping ahead of it. Well, no, well, I, I'd like to say that um, I could talk to you. I could be here till midnight and tell you, instant after instant, what my family was subjected to. We were, in a nutshell, we were terrorised, and acts had acts of terrorism against us, against our home. The time that they did um, taught in uh, October of two thousand two, uh, actually they broke into the house, the vacant house next door, uh, and actually they, they deliberately set the house on fire in the hopes that it would spread to my home. Yeah. And that was a very terrifying experience where we had uh, pungent black smoke come into the home and the kids were hysterical. And the fire was, a, I mean, it was blazing sky high through the, the attic window and such like. And fortunately for us that the fire station wasn't too far away and four fire engines attended and, and, and sort of um, put a stop to that. But it's the trauma oh, yeah. I can't express to you. Yeah, the, 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 it must be terrifying to have the, the knowledge that people are literally trying to do you harm 
and then you look towards the state authorities that are supposed to protect you and they have all the laws and they have the resources and they have the ability and they essentially turn around and tell you it's your fault and you should just clear off. That's right. This is exactly how it was. And so there were numerous instances, uh, you know, time and time again, you, you lived in this uh, deep state of anxiety day in, day out, uh, actually. And uh, they were lawless and they'd done it with such impunity that you could only like on this kind of stuff to say what's happening in, to the minorities or pocket. Pakistani Christians. So it was as if it was as if the the persecution that Pakistani Christians we were suffering the same fate. You were suffering it in Bradford. In Bradford, and I then um, done my best to appeal to the local imams, the local mosques, who who all knew me over the years that I lived, uh, and uh, and such like. Uh, and what was their response? Um, their the, their response was kind of lukewarm, and then yeah, we we were uh, they're out of our control, they're out of our jurisdiction. They made every excuse, but they didn't. They knew who these culprits were. I named them. Mm. Uh, they were their local uh, young men. So they were attending the mosque, were they? Uh, the, uh, Do you know? Uh, uh, um, possibly on a Friday prayers. But, Maybe. But yeah. Okay. However, but they, they, I appeal to every um, uh, kind of leader, community leader, imam in the community, uh, and they. Uh, it came to nothing, and nor was I ever visited by them mm. actually. And so, uh, after several years of going through this, making a, uh, a stance, because I felt, hold on, this is not Pakistan. I don't live in an Islamic country. I'm not in the Middle East. Uh, this is a free democratic country, yeah. uh, which has a, a law system. But it came to a point where we were left absolutely no alternative. Uh, and then we, by... Uh, is it an expression moonlighting? Yeah. Uh, we actually left. Uh, we moonlighted and we left our property. You were forced out your own home. We were forced out of our own home in sort of like June of 2006. And we relocated to the property, which I'll, I will discuss with you, where we've again been vacated by 10 armed police. So you, you, you moved. You moved home. Yeah, 2006. And what? The the, 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 the I mean, because I'm I'm conscious of time. Um, is it a case that the harassments started again, or? Well, we moved to this. Uh, we relocated uh, in June 2006, and we set about rebuilding our lives. And again, you appreciate the the distress, the trauma. The children were pretty young, uh, actually, and so my oldest boy was 10 at the time, uh, and. The, uh, sort of two years younger piece uh, uh, as you drop down actually and so I was then approached so about two years after being into this new property mm. I was approached by dispatches documentary and they uh, said look we've come to understand that there is this terrible situation with converts and this life and death uh, scenario in this country and would you like to contribute and I said well I feel very passionate about this we've gone through these terrible experiences where I've had three cars written off one's torched outside my home another one rammed outside my home and written off and the third one um, uh, it was pounced on by um, 20 30 young men these jobbers dancing on the roof from the bonnet kicking all the doors and they wrote it off and and the, the, the daily threats to our, our lives and, and intimidation. So, yeah, I want to speak out. So, what I, as a result of contributing to that, to that dispatch documentary called On the Holy War, the, the clan, Pakistani family, a few doors away, who own three joint houses and still doing it, they then took it upon themselves to then, uh, again, like in the first instance, uh, completely from saying good morning and having all these conversations to completely turn their back on us, uh, shunning us, but not that it doesn't just stop there. You wouldn't really mind mm. if they felt not to sort of speak to you again. Yeah, you just ignore them. But they then obviously make a point of showing this utter contempt. They then malign you in the whole area. Uh, he, he's a kufr, a kafir, he's, a, he's an infidel. Uh, he's working for the American missionaries, he's, uh, and so all these rumours, malicious rumours, mm. uh, spread 
in and around the whole area. This is the, the this is the kind of thing that they throw at speakers at Christian speakers at speakers' corner. Oh, you're paid missionaries. Mm, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get we get I, the I, same. I, 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 but I, I, now yeah. we get to see what what the tone of that comment is. Yeah, it's the, it's the case of every kind of uh, evil deception yeah. possible to then uh, con- malign you amongst the so-called Muslim community. And these mm. are my own sort of Pakistani fellow countrymen if you like so they're villainizing you they villainize me actually and then so and what what, what? And then it, it it carries it it goes up to the um cv school where the children were and they started becoming uh, victims through their friends who would disassociate themselves from them uh, call them all manner of names say to them our parents have said we mustn't sit next to you uh you you you're um you're a, um, you're a christian um you know you're a coffer and so the kids started suffering terribly uh, in, in the CV school. And I personally, myself, um, on occasion, uh, actually um, would uh, get these terrible um, remarks and intimidation sort of uh, by way of a, of a jostle here or a nudge there, but, you know. Uh, and it, be- it becomes very precarious for not only your own safety, but your children's sort of welfare mm. and of course the head teacher uh, doesn't want to tackle it it becomes a, a, a big political issue and um, of course um, you know in the end I was forced to pull my children out so of a CV school uh, primary school. so so the head teacher of the school uh, didn't want to tackle it because it was too much of a hot potato too much of a hot potato because obviously uh, more and more, but you got, became this this particular CV school uh, in in, in Manningham, uh, um, in Heaton rather in Bradford became predominantly um, Pakistani um, sort of uh, attendance by yeah. their pupils and and of course it's just it almost becomes like a, a mob rule situation again. During this during this time, what support were you receiving from individual Christians of? Your fellowship or individual Christians in the area? Uh, no, no support, actually. And then, were you uh, telling them about your situation? I, I was telling them about my situation. And what was their reaction? Well, we had a meeting with the, the then bishop, uh, David James, two thousand and five. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, this is after they torched my my home uh, mm. in two thousand and five. Yeah. So, uh, and um, uh, the bishop wasn't happy that I was even there. I had to remind him that uh, he's. Uh, advisor, this uh, academic, self-proclaimed or whatever um, expert on Islam, he invited me there, and uh, Philip Lewis, and he asked me, you know, uh, what do you want me to do? And then one of the people from my camp, who I took along, and said, I think Nisar Sisi is a leader of Christendom, mm. to which he looked quite uh, baffled by, and then he said, would you welcome converts to your church, would you welcome Nisar and his family to the church? And he said yes, in the same breath he said, that is to say no. He said yes, but that is In the same say. breath he said that's to say no. And I, I, I was completely beside myself, I, I was shocked at his statement. So Bishop of the Church of England, he said he didn't want you... He didn't want us to, no. And he, at and his church. And, 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 and then he, he followed up by saying the reason for that is we don't have resources and houses to look after them. And the, uh, at that time, I'd gone in, I, I, uh, I was involved with, with a black um, church, a uh, Jamaican yeah. church, and the yeah. pastor that was with me, he, he leapt to his feet, he was livid with the man, and he said, well, all you're fit for is uh, appeasing the Muslims. And uh, we left, actually. Um, and uh, it was a terrible betrayal. It, uh, that's the first betrayal, um, because I did see the... The, the established church of Islam and bishops as the, um, um, uh, how can I say, uh, our guardians, our protectors, actually. You know. uh, well, the suppo- bishops are supposed to be leaders of the Christian community. Yeah, I did see him as a leader of, of Christendom, if I can put it that way. But I think, I think the reality is that many of the bishops, particularly bishops of the Church of England, see themselves more as civil servants of public yeah, yeah, civic I've, society. Uh, having uh, um, opportunities then to sort of continue to try to get them to support us and then different bishops moving in and out so uh, Nick Baines came in after David James uh, actually and literally sort of 
uh, eight minutes, to, ten minutes walk from the Bishop's Palace from my sort of front door. Um, he's another one that didn't uh, intervene, support mm -hmm. in any way. And then uh, 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 prior to my, uh, just after my attack actually, this new one, Toby Howarth, uh, another appalling, um, uh, I, 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 I've got to say on record, I see them as Judases, that's, you know, they have, they've betrayed myself, my family, and they've betrayed us as converts. Now, because, because we are going to publish this, I have to state for the record that these are obviously Nissar's um, allegations, and we will give each of these bishops, um, if we can reach them, the opportunity to respond um, and invite them to interview and and to to talk about these situations. But you're obviously speaking from your your sense of looking to these people for help. Yes. And and getting nothing from them except, uh, I'm guessing platitudes. Uh, and... no, no, nothing at all. They they uh, um, uh, it is as I say. Uh, we've been uh, heartbroken. I, I've even had Justin Welby in a chance meeting at the Focus Convention yeah. back in uh, August of 2014, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, uh, he dismissed. I, I, I actually was talking to a Bishop Josiah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, is he the head of Gafcon? I, I don't. Know. I believe he's the head of Gafcon. And Justin Wolby actually got jumped onto the uh, onto the podium at this place in Camber Sands, the the, the Focus Conference mm. that they having um, they having a, a big top um, actually, and the um, the chap um, the Alpha Course uh, remind me his name Bob um, Nick Nicky Gumble uh, Nicky Gumble yeah so the, uh, somebody invites us there and just to get my family out of the out of the trenches i just i went along and mm. got my, my kids out uh, and some of them were really struggling as teenagers now and we were under siege much of the, it became very very dangerous and precarious towards the end yeah and while i was talking to this bishop, bishop josiah uh, i explained to him the failure of the bishops in bradford uh, and us as converts and he genuinely was um uh, gobsmacked um that uh, justin welby deliberately came over mm. And he, uh, he uh, interrupted our conversation and began to sort of pull this chappy uh, and lead him away. And I said, Mr. Wolby, I need a few minutes of your time. I need to discuss with you what we are suffering as converts and what we've gone through in Bradford and the failure of the um, uh, Anglican Church. And he, he dismissed me the wave of his hand and, yes, we know all about that, he said, and uh, almost with contempt. And we're doing all we can. And, uh, uh, and the more I impressed upon him to give me a few minutes, uh, the worst situation became, and he, he physically led this Bishop Josiah away from me, knowing I was having this uh, a conversation with him. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, and as I tried to get him just just to to engage with me, uh, some of his people uh, blocked me, uh, and, and and away he went. Actually. So what 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 I mean, um, yeah. Um, and Toby Howard has gone on to. Uh, it's all to do with inter. Well, I've come to know these people as careerists, as you say, as politicians. When, when did the media pick up on your situation? Oh, uh, well, the, the media going back, uh, sort of, uh, uh, nine, around about two thousand. And at that time, it, it was really spiraling big. But you appreciate, Bob, uh, as a family man with a young family, going through trauma, going through uh, these daily fears. Uh, and stresses and strains, uh, I wasn't uh, in a position to be interviewed with uh, 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 and not that particularly knowledgeable on, on apostasy and such like. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I I kind of refrained from giving them sort of full stories and the full picture. But then, uh, as I say, as time has gone on, with the political crackers of the age and the way things have been turned around. And, uh, and uh, Muslims have become a protected class, despite the fact that they are the perpetrators and in, in our, our respect, yeah. concerning the apostasy law, I've come to realize the most cardinal sin in Islam, and, and you'll understand this, four Islamic schools of thought, uh, or Islamic jurisprudence, mm. and one of the Shiite, uh, al Jafri. Mm. The, it, it, I would like to say on record right now, and people can go away and look at this, 
in Islam, in black and white, it is agreed upon these five Islamic schools of thought, the ulema, that apostasy is worthy of death. You have eight countries uh, where it's a capital punishment. And they did try to take your life, didn't they? Yes. There was a physical attack. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I told the police that the, this clan family were instigating an attack on me uh, back in August of 2015. They dismissed it like everything else they've dismissed for all these years. And uh, actually, uh, and of course, um, under the cover of darkness in the fall, uh, as I got into my car, uh, I was uh, I ended up almost being bludgeoned to death. Bludgeoned to death. Girl yeah. was. Baseball. I saw the, the video cam, yep. it was captured. But who, someone came and rescued you, who was that? Uh, actually, uh, it was uh, a couple of Polish neighbours several doors up the road, yeah. who happened to be outside, fortunately for me, yeah. uh, because I wouldn't be here to tell the, 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 the tale. Uh, and um, uh, they came running uh, to my aid, and uh, of course these cowards had uh, then fled, actually. Uh, I spent um, 11 days uh, in hospital. Uh, I, I, I subsequently ended up being kneecapped. Yeah. and suffered a broken hand trying to protect my head from being bludgeoned in. And the police called in an assault, by the way. It's all, it was all played down. And so it wasn't a hate crime? Uh, at that point, this, well, not at that crimes. point, uh, the, this chief inspector, this Mr. Reese Cooper... It wasn't an attempt to murder? Uh, no. They, just they, an assault they, with baseball just, bats just, and crowbars? Just an head. assault. Uh, yeah, yeah, they called it an assault. Because obviously. Um, um, he uh, took it upon himself then to uh, go back with all the previous uh, incidents and label it as a hate crime. Yeah. He took it home. Who did this? Uh, the, the chief inspector, this uh, Mr. Reese Cooper. Well, Lord where Lord is due, you know. But prior to that, it wasn't classed as a religious hate They, they refused to log it as a religious hate crime. Yeah. And acknowledged that uh, what we were suffering was hate crime. Uh, uh, and they failed to understand. They'd rejected this thing about apostasy. Uh, completely. Yeah. In summary then, um, to the bishops of the Church of England and to the establishment, um, what would you like to say to them? Uh, I would like to say to them, uh, shame on them. Uh, they are a, um, a disgrace to their um, dog collars, uh, actually, and their titles. And they are, uh, they are weak and pathetic, actually. And so where they should have stood with us uh, and of they're, they're, they're also their weak stance on apostasy, uh, yeah. and which they've never been um, outspoken about. And let's be fair, uh, when you have Arsia Bibi, which we all know about, mm. who suffered 10 years of incarceration, eight of which of solitary confinement, yeah. who was uh, actually, and they've never spoken out in all these years against the... Uh, terrible affliction and sufferings of our Christian brothers and sisters in Pakistan under the, 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 the terrible blasphemy law, uh, actually, uh, I, I have absolutely no um, faith in them whatsoever. Uh, and again, their agenda is into faith uh, and this false, like you say. So, uh, like, like you, you, you feel, uh, am I right in summarising that you feel that for political correctness and for... Um, you know, a false ecumenism, both church and the, the, the established church of England and the state found your suffering to be a nuisance to the narrative that was guiding the way their institutions were working, police and, ch and change. I couldn't say it better myself, Bob. We are a complete anathema. Yeah. yeah. And they've been complicit, if anything. But, yeah. but one group has helped you. I believe so. so yeah. There have been Christians that have reached out. Yeah, to I, I know. I, I when I first heard about your story, years before I got involved in soccer films, I tried to reach out to find you. Um, Thank you so much. And and I know other Christians have have reached out, and I think it's important to to give them an honourable mention. So, so who were that? Uh, yeah, uh, certainly. It, it's it's been uh, Barnabas Fund, Patrick Sukdale. Patrick Sukdale. If it wasn't for that dear man. Uh, I wouldn't be under a roof. Yeah. Um, they supported us uh, at the time of my attack. It took me several months to get on my feet, and they were amazing. Uh, God bless him. God bless uh, Barnabas Fund and all the staff. Yeah. Um, and the various people that pulled together uh, to uh, get me and my family out of a, a life and death situation, actually. Yeah. Can I just mention very quickly, um, Bob, uh, we have had a high level meeting uh, some weeks ago with Lord Pearson in the House of Lords. 
to raise the the uh, the apostasy issue in this country mm. that why somebody who's born and raised in this country as a British subject uh, has been under the cosh of apostasy and why many thousands of converts ex-muslims are suffering the same fate potentially mm -hmm. uh, through sort of um, threats and the fear uh, of losing their lives um, that uh, they are living these um, uh, underground lives uh, in fear uh, actually uh, and so uh, and Lord Pearson has raised um, these questions in the house uh, I believe it was the 2nd of December mm. okay and I, I, I want to ask and request very humbly by your good people that are watching this actually or will be that if they can go online uh, punch in the legalized apostasy um, uh, petition yeah and if they can read through that actually you can get their local uh, MPs councillors uh, actually um, imams bishops uh, church leaders to get behind this and if they needed to send it to me print it off send it to me via Facebook so we can start now raising this deception that's gone on for over four decades mm. uh, multiculturalism has failed because as a British subject I needed full protection of government authorities and, you didn't have it. and church and we didn't have it actually and so it's taken uh, an enormous amount of grit and grace on the part of my wife and my children us as a family who have suffered this and words don't do me justice okay and I think it's very very important that people do recognize that uh, Islam my own community my Pakistani countrymen have for over four decades uh, hidden this agenda of apostasy it's very much there and it affects many tens of thousands of ex-Muslims mm. well um, as I say I we've it's a shame that we we've run out of time because I think that the the sort of the, the the end of this interview has been a bit compressed when it would have been nice to sort of pad it out but we are sadly out of time I understand um, so I want to thank you very much for um, inviting us to your home um, giving us your your time um, I, I do I do want to mention that um, there that we are going to publicize a way that if you want to help this family who are true confessors of the faith and have bore their cross um, in a very literal way emotionally and physically and have suffered for it um, we will we will um, highlight how you can do that there is a what it's um it's a fund go fund me page yeah that, that was set up by a supporter last september actually bob yeah and uh, we're very grateful to him and and, yeah. and and how can they find it what's it called uh, uh it's a go fund me page and of course they, they would put in my name nisa hussein thereafter and, nisa uh, hussein yeah. on go fund me yeah. and it was set up by someone after you were assaulted I uh actually it or was, was it when you had it, to it, it was, home it, it for was, the second time yeah it was it, yeah when we left our home but it, it was it, for the second time was yes it? Uh, it, it was done last september not the time of the attack um we're not motivated by money but yeah. you appreciate uh, Bob. what's happened is that um uh, as some people now who are under police protection uh, and of course um, suffering trauma and, uh, I, what I call the fallout yeah. which has been immense in many respects I have a house that's not sold yet uh, there's, there's been this terrible consequence and fallout of what we've gone through actually and so um, I, I'm deeply humbled by you mentioning that thank you so much yeah. Bob um, well I, I, yeah. I, 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 I think it's important that as Christians we rediscover what it means to stand in solidarity with one another and to stand up for our own community and uh, we can see clearly that there is a real need for that to come from the ground because it's certainly not coming from the so-called leadership but I, I want to close in saying that I and I'm sure many Christians who are watching this around the world are going to be praying for the full restoration of you, mm. your, your circumstance. We uh, find the testimony, your testimony, to be inspiring. Um, and, and it's important to remember that it isn't just the testimony of, of the man sitting in front of you. It's the whole family that's not on camera. 
um, and we've had yeah, a chance right. to meet a few of them um, and they're a lovely family they're well worthy of your prayer and your support and yeah. your encouragement um, and yeah thank you very much thank you Bob. God bless you God bless you. take care God, God, bless. God bless God bless peace with you thank you, thank you. So um, we're just on our way back from meeting with Nissar. Uh, we're on the train, hence the rockety um, filming. Um, it was literally very tight in terms of getting the train back. Um, I mean, coming from that interview, my reflections are firstly how disturbing it is to hear the fact that the police um, and now that we know of so many other accounts of these kinds of things, that the police are literally just just wash their hands of, of Nissar's situation, that they um, blame the victim of harassment, uh, intimidation, assault, and um, attempted murder, it would seem. Um, and that their, their attitude is rather than rather than stand up for the law is to cower to the mob and to blame the one individual rather than face up to the fact something that we spoke about on our soccer films before the the deep christophobia uh, that exists within the muslim community and emanates out from um, certain sections of that community I think what is also uh, deeply distressing from Nissar's story is the total incompetence and um, cowardice of church leadership. That rather than create the structures, institutions, culture, attitude and, and real sense of Christian solidarity to support people like Nissar, people like Mohammed Fiaz uh, and the others who we know of but have not yet necessarily caught on film who've become Christians from a Muslim background they would rather just brush their plight under the carpet because that's easier than falling out with the establishment um, and standing up for your own community this kind of leadership is not leadership that we need um, in the UK we need better leadership uh, particularly within the church in the West which on the whole sees itself as civil servants rather than as true leaders of the Christian community um, they're ineffective and pointless but I think finally the other thing that comes out of this story is the incredible determination and courage of that whole family uh, who are true confessors of the faith they have suffered for the faith they have carried their cross daily and have bore the wounds of, of Christ as as white martyrs of the faith and as Christians we need to rediscover what it means to stand in solidarity with those who are suffering for the faith to stand with them in their suffering and standing with our brothers and sisters in their suffering is not a, a reason to just give platitudes that don't lead to anything. It has to be followed by real actions, real actions of, of support. Um, because there are literally thousands of converts from Islam in this country, uh, many of whom who are suffering for that choice and they're suffering quietly because no one wants to tell their story but we want to tell your story. So if you are a convert from Islam and you want to share your story, um, we can protect your identity in that we can blur your face um, and we can we can ensure that, that no one can recognize you unless they were doing it through your voice. Um, but if you want to tell your story, we want to hear it. And I would ask those, I would ask people to ask themselves what kind of country are we living in when a Christian family has been driven out of Bradford uh, because of the deeply rooted prejudice of others and that has become acceptable. Uh, why are we not 
outraged by that. Why should we not be outraged by that? The liberal do-gooders who accuse people of, um, you know, Islamophobia for, for highlighting these things. I mean, just take the time to look at yourselves in the mirror and, and realize what you are attempting to mask over. Realize what you are attempting to sideline and to make acceptable through through your rhetoric that seeks to suppress the facts facts as we have recorded today i would encourage you to think again because you have been misguided and for those of you who are muslims who like nisa when he was younger um like mohammed fiaz um who who are looking at the new testament and you're asking is this true well the answer is yes and there are many people who are saying yes to Christ and saying yes to the truth and you can be one of them. It is not the case that you have to live a lie. You can come out and it is only when enough people come out that this sense of fear will be broken. Um, and that will present a challenge to the establishment. That will present a challenge to the state that on camera tells everyone that they believe in tolerance and that they believe in standing up for minority rights but in reality increasingly the evidence suggests that they are selective about which minority rights they're willing to stand up for.